of the most common things you hear when people describe the work of Junji Ito is that he's a true master of Lovecraftian horror. His stories are known for their subtle, slow-burning terror about subjects like the gradual uncovering of ancient truths too great and terrible for us to bear that we succumb to insanity. Some of Junji Ito's works are held up as masterpieces of this school of horror, like Uzumaki, the tale of a sedate Japanese coastal town that slowly gets consumed by the grotesque madness of an ancient, world-devouring curse. Or Gyo, his epic about wretched abominations from the depth of the ocean surfacing and taking revenge for humanity's ongoing transgressions. A story that will have you look with different eyes at our oceans, which still remain less explored than the depth of space. That's where Hellstar Remina takes place, or rather, in which the world falls prey to complete chaos and madness in the face of literal cosmic obliteration by an ancient galaxy devouring life form from outer space. These grand scale cosmic horror narratives are some of his most pervasive works known to Western audiences. Yet, the more I read of Ito's works, the more I started to appreciate his more condensed, intimate, and thoroughly Kafkaesque stories. Ito is peerless when it comes to crafting short, self contained narratives that focus on a singular core emotion while bringing plenty of detail and nuance to support and cement its message. And typically dressed in his iconically shocking, grotesque imagery that unapologetically glues the impressions to the readers' minds. One of his most renowned works in that regard is Slug Girl, or as I love to call it, Junji Ito's The Metamorphosis. This one-off short story was originally released in Japan in 1997 in Volume 7 of the Horror World of Junji Collection. It gained fame and recognition for its abject body horror panels of the girl with the slug crawling out of her mouth. It's not far-fetched to assume that the reason it became such a staple for Junji Ito's works is that it's a near-perfect showcase for the narrative contrast that makes his stories so enthralling. Beautiful, highly detailed line art that uncompromisingly utilizes grotesque and repulsive imagery to draw your attention to awe, but never for the sake of mere provocation. Slug Girl is, at its heart, a poignant tale relatable to anyone who grew up into isolation, alienation, and soul-crushing rejection because of who you are. Yuko's story is the quintessential tale of the pain and the horror of being different. Slug Girl is every bit as absurd and appalling as you'd expect from a good Junji Ito short story, and it has, all things considered, a quite straightforward plot. It tells the tale of Yuko and her gradual transformation into a horrible vermin. The story is told from the perspective of her classmate and cousin Rie, who has been noticing that her otherwise lively and talkative friend has lately become increasingly reticent and introverted. Aside from that, people started noticing how her speech became progressively unintelligible, as if there was something in her mouth. Eventually, she wouldn't attend class at all anymore. One day, after school, Rie decides to visit Yuko at her home. The house's front door is locked and nobody answers, so she checks out the backyard. She finds Yuko's parents in the middle of wrestling a snail infestation angrily dousing slugs and salt and stomping them to death in disgust. When the mother notices Rie, she lets her into the house and confides that Yuka had been in her room all day and that her doctor had been expressing worry about her mental health lately. When they enter Yuka's room, they find her feeling terribly unwell. Her face covered in a protective mask, she keeps holding her mouth shut in glaring discomfort and, in apparent shame, shouts at them to get out and leave her alone. The fear that Rie saw in Yuko's eyes, it throws her back to a time back in elementary school when Yuko's classmates used to prank scare her, 
teasing her with slugs from her backyard. And she recalls how utterly terrified it had made her. It had traumatized Yuko so much that she never set foot in the slug-infested backyard anymore after that incident again. The following day, Rie returns to check up on Yuko again, when the mother rushes toward the door in panic. She was expecting the doctor to arrive, as Yuko had apparently gotten worse overnight. At that moment, Rie and Yuko's mother turn around to see her standing in the doorframe, choking, retching. Something seems to be trying to crawl out of her mouth. A giant slug forces itself out. It seems that it's her tongue that it somehow transformed into a slimy mollusk, slithering and leaving a trail of slime across her face. Scared and appalled, Rie flees from the scene in fear, fear of the terrifying changes her friend is undergoing. After that, Rie never returned to her cousin's house and was only told of Yuko's blight by her parents. As they told it, Yuko, disgusted by her horrible mutations, attempted to cut off her tongue with scissors, but it just kept growing back, no matter how often she tried. Her parents kept her in bed, tried to rinse her mouth with salt to douse and kill the parasite in her mouth, but Yuko's body forcefully rejected the salt, spitting and retching it out in pain and disgust. She kept getting worse and worse, and since the slug in her mouth made her unable to take in any food, she became skinnier and weaker by the day. Eventually, the parents decided they had to resort to more extreme measures to take on the parasite. They filled a bathtub with salt, even though before, Yuko had clearly displayed repulsion towards salt. But ultimately, weakened and feeble, she submitted and completely submerged herself in the tub. And didn't come back up again. Her parents, in panic, reached into the salt, trying to grab her, pull her out, but they couldn't find her body. Her father eventually pulled her pajamas out, but Yuko wasn't in them. Eventually, they found something. Yuko's lifeless head emerged, without a body, salt running down her hair, her face completely motionless, eyes shut. The parents eventually found that her whole body had completely shrunken down to the size of a tiny, shriveled appendix. Not knowing what to do, they poured running water over her, rinsing off the salt and hoping that Yuko's body somehow would restore to its former shape. However, the slug remained intact. It had turned Yuko's head into its shell and carried her tired and apathetic face on its back as it crawled its way into the backyard. From that point on, the snail spent her days in that slug-infested backyard, and any passerby gazing at it would get a sad, hopeless look from the shell, from Yuko, in return. One of my favorite aspects of this particular type of Junji Ito short story is that it's laden with allegorical imagery, and it's rarely subtle. Sure, you can totally read a tale like Slug Girl and take it literally. It is, for the record, completely valid to enjoy it for its visceral body horror alone. But without reading between the lines, these stories can easily feel like arbitrary torture and shock fetishization needlessly cruel for the apparent sake of cruelty itself. A high school girl, for no apparent reason, pain and shamefully mutates into a giant mollusk and then spends the rest of her days as the sad and lonely appendage of her completely indifferent parasitic hijacker organism. The end. If a teacher asks in class, so, what was the story about? You'd probably have some eager beaver raise her hand and say, It's about a girl who turns into a slug. And I mean, sure, that's, yeah, that's what is taking place in the panels. But that's not really what Slug Girl is about now, is it? Seriously though, on that note, I'd live for Junji Ito being taught in class. Stories like Slug Girl are so powerful because of what they have to say, and because of how that resonates with people emotionally even if it's on a purely subconscious level. 
I think this is ultimately one of the biggest reasons why this short story always reminded me of Franz Kafka's 1915 literary classic The Metamorphosis, or Die Verwandlung, in the original German title. The Metamorphosis is one of Kafka's most notorious works, renowned for its grotesque and absurd plot that famously opens with protagonist Gregor Samsa one day waking up from uneasy dreams to find himself transformed into a horrible vermin. These two stories, despite their obvious thematic similarities, do differ in various key plot points. Kafka's tale, for instance, starts with the protagonist waking up already transformed into a giant insect while Slug Girl focuses mainly on Yuko's transformation into the eponymous Slug. Yuko is manga-typical, a high school student, while Gregor Samsa is a salesman in his early 20s. Both live in the house of their parents, though. And while the metamorphosis is told directly from the perspective of the protagonist, Samsa, Junji Ito's short story is narrated from the viewpoint of the deuteragonist, Rie and then later through third-party accounts of Yuko's parents, which gives it an almost epistolary quality. And while Yuko's story ends with her transformation completed and hints at how she's going to spend the rest of her days on the back of the slug in the backyard of her parents' house, the metamorphosis, spoiler, ends with Samsa's miserable demise and his family feeling finally liberated of the great burden his existence put on them. But despite these differences, you can easily spot the common emotional kernel these stories share. Although they were written on the other side of the globe, and nearly a century apart, both works center around the exact same anxieties of being different in a cultural and social environment that categorically rejects you for it. Kafka's short story has been, throughout the years, often analyzed and discussed. And in hindsight, it's almost painful to see how many even highly regarded interpretations of his story ended up completely omitting its allegorical meta-plot, claiming that it's just a weird fantasy world. Like, next thing you're gonna tell me Animal Farm is not a book about farm animals doing just normal animal farm things, huh? <laughs> In hindsight, the metamorphosis reads like a desperate cry for help of someone who tries to express their struggles with depression and social anxiety in a time when mental illness literacy was practically non-existent. And throughout the story, Kafka vividly describes multiple clear symptoms of clinical depression. Samsa's grotesque outer appearance has, yes, a repulsive effect on other people, but it's never regarded as something absolutely otherworldly. Nobody ever freaks out that their family member is suddenly a literal giant insect. They just judge, reject, and eventually hate him for it. For being different in a way they don't understand and don't want to empathize with. The story of Gregor Samsa is a literalization of how social alienation works in the real world. The protagonist is obviously and outwardly different from his community, which looks down on him and actively works to exclude him from polite society. His otherness makes him literally feel like a vermin, a plague and parasite that has no right to exist in a society that he is not able to contribute to in a way it's expected of him. Suffering from depression, from social anxiety, or from any other debilitating and visible illness, and being exposed to constant judgment for not being able to fulfill what society expects of you, despite you constantly trying your hardest, it's devastating and soul-crushing. These things usually happen over a lifetime of perpetual microaggressive behavior within your environment. It slowly but unforgivingly grinds your self-confidence to dust. I am convinced that both of these stories carry such a lasting legacy because many, many readers see themselves in their surreal Kafkaesque realities, even if it's just on a subconscious level. Because almost everyone, at some point in their life, finds himself in a situation where they feel like a misfit in their environment, suddenly finding that you either are or have become different in ways that you'd never known nor expected, in ways that everyone around you, including yourself, has looked down upon. Slug Girl is a story about bigotry. Not about openly expressed prejudice lived as a conscious conviction, but 
about the subliminal kind of bigotry that permeates society and destroys you from within your personal circle of trust. Ito deliberately chose to include several plot points that support this subtext about the horrors of microaggressive bigotry a bit too conveniently to be mere coincidence. Story beats that would be completely superfluous in a straight up girl turns into a slug because suffer porn is edgy tale. Yuko gradually loses her ability to communicate and recedes from her social circles, which puts emphasis on her inability to grasp and express the sudden changes in her and how they clash with society's idea of normality. Her parents are repeatedly shown expressing disgust and hatred towards slugs, as well as flashbacks to Yuko's childhood highlighting how everyone around her has always naturally treated slugs as something abject and appalling, undesirable. These elements are quite explicit metaphors for culturally normalized compulsory bigotry. And this is supported by the fact that all the help her surroundings, her parents, extend to Yuko are purely destructive, aiming at erasing the thing that makes Yuko different, that makes Yuko who she is. The four characters central to the story represent different facets of everyday, well-meaning, but ultimately harmful microaggressive personality types within our quote-unquote safe social environments. The father is a rigid-minded traditionalist. He embodies typical old-fashioned masculine values. He engages his daughter's predicament with a we-need-to-fix-her mentality, trying to solve a problem like he'd repair a car. He resorts to brute force methods based on nothing but conjecture, disregarding and overstepping clearly telegraphed boundaries in the process, like repeatedly exposing Yuko to salt despite her rejecting it painfully and despite knowing full well that salt kills slugs. Through his actions, he causes intense, long-lasting physical and psychological harm. He represents rigid normativity. Yuko's mother is the flip side of the parental societal bigotry coin. She's timid and compliant in everything her more dominant spouse decides. Several times she shows doubt and uncertainty about his decisions, yet she ultimately ignores her instincts and empathetic impulses. Despite wanting the best for her daughter, her indecisiveness makes her a bystander and accomplice in Yuko's suffering. She represents compliance with normativity. Her friend and cousin Rie is intuitively appalled by Yuko's changes. Her transformation scares Rie to a degree that she's incapable of staying in her very presence, repeatedly fleeing in panic despite Yuko never actually showing any aggression or posing any danger towards her. And the fact that the second half of the story is only retold through hearsay and she never returns to Yuko's house after the first exposure with her real nature is not just coincidental. Rie represents a knee-jerk reaction to confronting something outside of the understood normal. Compulsory normativity. Instead of trying to explore or understand what is happening, she rejects Yuko, giving into a subconscious fear. Speaking in outdated Freudian terms, her id screams, what if you're a slug too? While her ego claws at the mere idea of entertaining such avenues of thought. To her, subconsciously, an open mind is opening the doors for invasive ideas, which is why she stays away even though Yuko never once posed a threat to her. Yuko herself embodies the end result, the canvas for culturally ingrained bigotry. She begins her transformation from a position of deeply conditioned bias, accumulated over a lifetime of normalized rejection and fear of otherness. The moment it breaks out, it causes an intense internal conflict to erupt in her, a violent dysphoria that causes her shame, self-loathing and drives her towards self-harming behavior and self-mutilation. This is driven by the desire to force her way back into that bubble of safety, because she intuitively knows how society treats what doesn't fit into their walls of accepted normality. The genre of body horror is quite commonly employed as a vessel to explore fears and anxieties rooted in cultural normativity our intuitive repulsion from things outside of our walls of normality. 
things that society deems unsafe, abject and undesirable. Slug Girl manages an effective split between grotesque absurdity and crystal clear allegory. Like Kafka's Metamorphosis, it is intriguing for its grotesque imagery, but it doesn't obfuscate its message. Slug Girl is ambiguous and abstract because it doesn't aim to address one specific thing, and through that it manages to become relatable from so many different angles. Because marginalization within someone's cultural bubble of safety always shares the same underlying patterns. Slug Girl can be about growing up in a heteronormative society where homophobia is lived out openly and casually by your surroundings, in a culture where kids in the schoolyard use homosexuality to intimidate and emasculate other kids long before they have a grasp of the concept of sexuality, only to come to the realization that you yourself are attracted to the same sex. It can be about coming of age with media that thoughtlessly and ignorantly stigmatizes mental health illnesses, violent as evil as abject. And then one day, you get diagnosed with it yourself. It can be about growing up in a culture with rigid, strictly enforced binary gender norms, unconsciously internalizing transphobia by soaking through microaggressive language and behavior among friends, family and social networks, only to come to the realization that your gender identity is not the one you've been assigned at birth. The internal conflict this creates comes from the notion of being something that you've learned and internalized over a lifetime to intuitively reject. Dysphoria is so pernicious because it's a primal force that's rooted deep inside of you, while the culture you live in relentlessly fertilizes it by steeping you in all its biases and normalized bigotry. And when it erupts, it ravages you from within. Slug Girl is about growing up among bigotry that's so common and normalized that most people don't even realize it's there. Kauka's bug story was based on his own personal experiences and conflicts, but the patterns displayed in both of these stories are so representative for how cultural normativity pushes undesirable deviations into the margins that they resonated with many readers who saw a bit of themselves in Gregor and Yuko. The treacherous thing about our supposedly well-intentioned bastion of cultural safety is that the whole concept of desirable normality is an illusion. It's a construct that demands conformity as the price of admission, and that can only function if we're willing to deem those that don't fit our arbitrary ideals unworthy and undesirable. When these margins of safety are challenged, when those we believe to protect from harm end up outside of these barriers, it shatters the illusion. But it's they who pay the price for it. Yuko's sad and hopeless gaze, condemned to live the rest of her days as a literal shell, a husk of the elusive idea of what her society wanted her to be, is a warning to all of us. The nail that sticks out gets hammered in. Slug Girl is a cautionary tale, a warning to keep our minds and hearts open to the ways in which each and every one of us might, unknowingly and inadvertently, think, speak, or act in ways that contribute to a climate of silent exclusion. Thank you so much for watching this slightly extensive exploration of Junjito's Slug Girl, and for your patience waiting for it. This video took start to finish several months of work, and the reason I'm able to do this, to give these deep and mature topics the quality treatment I believe they deserve, without sacrificing quality or having to censor myself for advertisers, are my Patreon supporters. If you would like to help me out as well, please consider supporting my channel over on Patreon with a monthly donation that is within your comfort levels. It makes a tremendous difference. So a massive thank you this time goes out to all members of my personal army of slugs. Thank you to Kaspar Ram, Jin Hansen, Faulty Gear, Andrew Hines, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Malim, Swallowtail Knights, Agustin Ortega, Pablo Arcelas, 
Terry Collins, Matt Gretton, Nathan O'Connor, Sophie Powelson, Max Macula, Dennis Pfefferkorn, Mura Kassardis, Sven Bischoff, Gehennas, Evan Tickle, Adriel Garcia, Arnie, Quentin Podom, Chuck Taylor, Dimitar Slatkov, Chris Chan, Ty McCandless, Kevin H. Yang, Chrissy, Laird Wackala, Lorenz A. Buben, Joey Monster, Billy Lott, Kenan Ward, aka Legolas Katarn, Nobad Gerard Matinga, and Wobbles and Bean the Wonder Ducks. Until next time, ta-ta!